Welcome to the John Freakin' Muir Pod. Lace up those boots and sling on the pack for a romp through trails, short and long. With your host and renaissance man, Doc, it's time to embrace the suck. Welcome back to another week on the trail, dirtbags and hiker trash. I'm Doc and this is the John Freakin' Muir Pod. Let's start off with a reminder, if you are enjoying the podcast, take just a minute, help us out, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, and if you're not enjoying the pod, well, just go ahead and keep that to yourself. All right, let's get to this week's guest, who is hike, a hiking podcaster himself, as well as a through hiker and a trail creator. Welcome to the John Freaking Muir Pod, all the way from France, Thomas Buis... Oh, Buis... <laughs> Buis... Buis... Help me Buis... out. Buis... 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 Buisagi. Yeah, Buisagi. Okay. Yes. I nailed it. I nailed it before the podcast started. And of course, that was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> nice. How's it going, Thomas? Um, it's um it's good. I'm uh, I'm back into civilization and uh it's uh, it's taking me a bit of a uh, uh, adjustment. But uh yeah, I'm starting to uh, to get the hang of um cars and stuff. <laughs> You've been out and about for a while, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was uh, on the um, on the trail for five months, um, and then I hid. Um, I hid in Toulouse, which is a city in the south of France, uh, for a month to try to recuperate from that. And now I'm back in Brussels, so uh, in a in a capital city. And yeah, that's uh, it's kind of a change. Brussels is not in France, though, is it? No, it's in Belgium. Belgium. It's it, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's right above France. And I'm I'm actually French, but I live in I've been living in Belgium for oh, something like 13 years. Um, so it's been a while. So welcome <laughs> to the John Freaking Muir Pod, all the way from Belgium, Thomas Buisagi. <laughs> yes, Thomas Buisagi. That's worked. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Thomas. In all that time out on the trail, do you, have you picked up a trail name, or is that is that like a uniquely American thing where people are, are handing out trail names uh, based on their oddities, peculiarities, where they're from, strange things that happened? So, so it's definitely uh, definitely an American thing. Um, so, I, I've done two uh, big hikes, two through hikes, which one was in Croatia and one was obviously in France. And those countries don't really have this culture of giving trail names. So, I don't really have a trail name based on a death trail, for example, and the people I met didn't give me one. But from, um, from Croatia, I actually got the trail name that was more of like a nickname people would call me because of one of my particularities so I guess it would fit the bill definitely uh, and this trail name was uh, Pomalo and Pomalo in uh, Croatian uh, is a word that basically says uh, take it easy like relax it's it's a word that they they use for um, everything pretty much. So like if you if you're running late and and you're sending a message like oh I'm sorry I might be late, they will say ah pomalo we don't care it's it it doesn't matter just you know take it one step after the other. And the reason why I got that one uh, was because I was the slowest hiker ever to finish the trail, and it's uh, something I'm very proud of. I'm extremely slow, and I would never, ever say no to anybody inviting me to have a drink. And in Croatia, they invited me a lot to have a lot of drinks. So <laughs> in the end, everybody was just happy to see me. Hey, Pomelo, come and have a drink. So yeah, it, it kind of stuck. <laughs> Pomelo. Does it translate to like chill in English? No, I would, I would really like it's more of a take it easy because it, it's okay. um, they they even use it in the south um, in Dalmatia. They even use it to say hello. They say to each other, "Pomalo, pomalo." It's 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 kind of a greeting. It's it's a it's a one word fits all kind of situation to be uh, cool. Okay, all right. Well, on the podcast, we try and go by trail names as much as possible. So I will sprinkle in some some pomalo uh, along. The way. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, and, and to make it a little bit more complicated, um, no. oh, most, no. most of the people know me as Cartapouille because it's the name I used when I was a teenager playing video games. And that's also the name of my Instagram. That's the name I have on the Discord channel with everybody else of the Hexatrek. So you can go by Thomas Cartapouille Pomalo and everything works. <laughs> Cartapouille? Cartapouille. Cartapouille? Is there an N at the end there? 
No, no, no. It's P O U I L L E uh, for the end. Puy. Oh. It's insanely French and absolutely impossible for foreigners um, to pronounce. And every time people were asking me, hey, where can I find you online? I say, oh, my Instagram, Katapuy. And every time I realize my mistake of using this name because nobody can understand that. <laughs> what does Katapuya mean? Literally nothing. It's it's um <laughs> it's it's literally a made up word that I found cool when I was a teenager. There is a story with a pool behind it, but I only talk about that when I have a beer. Um, and this name was unique in the world, and I found it super cool. And I was playing uh, Counter Strike and some kind of very hardcore video games. And as a teenager, you want to build some confidence, so everybody was using names like Nightmare uh, and the Fossoyeur, which in French is very terrifying. And I was coming in the arcade games called Cartapouille, and uh, that was my uh, little uh, pleasure to hear people say, hey, who is this Cartapouille who's killing us again? (laughs) All right, so Thomas it is. Yes, that works as well. (laughs) Hey, uh, (laughs) Pumalo, have you listened to the podcast before? No, I haven't. I haven't yet. Oh, this is great. You're coming in completely cold. Uh, (laughs) You're not sure what's what's laying in store for you, so uh, this is going to be great. I want to make sure that you are aware of a segment that we have towards the end called the Pro Tip Inside of the Week. That's where I will turn to you and ask you to share some trail wisdom with our listeners to make sure that their next outdoor experience is even better. So don't be surprised. All right, that's fine. I I, I can uh, can handle that. I mean, if you've been out there for five, six months at a time, I'm sure you've picked up some wisdom. So yeah, (laughs) a few things. We'll see. Okay. The Must Bring Gear Review. Hey, another feature we've been doing this season is the Must Bring Gear Review, sponsored by the Ultralight Backpacking Gear Company, Six Moon Designs. And here's how it works. If you were to let a stranger pack your bag with pretty much generic gear for a multi-day hike or a multi-month hike, what is the one specific piece of gear you would insist on being packed? And if you've got a particular brand for that specific piece of gear, even better. So, Pomelo, what is your must bring piece of gear out there? Ah, uh, um, actually, yeah, I thought about this question. Um, I could talk about a lot of things, like uh, my my pocket knife, which is a very French pocket knife. Um, it's an open nail. I could talk about my watch that I I love dearly, and I could not imagine going out in the world without it. But Thomas, I, I... Thomas, Thomas, hang on a second. I I can't let that pass. You, you you held up a pocket knife, and you said it's a very French pocket knife. What what makes a a pocket knife French? This is an opinel for the people who can uh, see it. Maybe um, the opinel is um, the standard pocket knife for French people for I don't know, like hundreds of years. It has been made uh, for the king usually, um, like originally. And on the uh, on the knife, you can see on the blade there is a little crown with um, a little hands. This is the hand of uh, some kind of royalty or something, and the crown, which indicates that it's from the king. Everybody in France will have this. This is the cheapest knife you can buy. It costs 10 euros, even less in some places. It is made out of carbon um, carbon um, mixed blade, so it means that it can rust, but you can sharpen it with literally anything, anytime. And it is... I, I own a Sibenza, which is uh, American-made, one of the most expensive blades you can find uh, <laughs> as a pocket knife, but I would never go out with my Sebenza because it's a fantastic knife. It's it's precision made, there is titanium and everything, but the Opinel is just indestructible, extremely easy to use. It has just like this lovely feature that is just wood. It's a wood handle that gets patina over time. The blade gets patina over time. It's the sharpest thing ever. You can sharpen it on literally when you have a coffee in town. You can sharpen it on the bottom of your coffee cup and you can always have like a sharp knife with you. I don't know a single person who goes out without this. And it's so famous, even in Croatia, they all have it. Um, it it's the best knife. It's a really the best knife. I just love this thing. So Thomas, <laughs> is, that a, is that a common thing? If I were to go to a, a coffee shop in France, all, all the guys and gals would be sitting there sharpening their knives on... on no, the no, and- actually... <laughs> no, actually, this is the thing that I discovered, and uh, this is a tip I gave to a lot of people who had it, um, because the the, um, the opinel will come in two different blades. You have the inox, so it means the stainless steel, and you have the carbon one. And most people now, for conveniency, will take the um, stainless steel, but don't be a fool. Don't do that. 
take the carbon version. It has been made to be a carbon version for a real reason, and it is to be uh, sharpened on literally anything. Even a rock can sharpen it. You, yeah, I'm pretty sure that my beard after two days can sharpen it as well. It's 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 very practical. It's just take the carbon version, and you will eat so many saucisson and cheese that it will be always greasy and will never rust. So, well, you heard it there from uh, from Pomelo. Don't be a fool. Take the carbon. Take the carbon. <laughs> Exactly. Right, but, I, but I interrupted you. You were you were waxing eloquent on your must bring piece of gear. Yeah, I, I can talk about my gear for hours. So I, I I will just talk about this thing that I have in my hand that the camera doesn't want to focus on. And this is obviously my beret. Um, I'm, I'm not wearing it right now because I have this helmet, uh, this uh, headphones. And if I uh, take it off, uh, I can't put it uh, correctly. But um, this beret is, um, has been sitting on my head for five months uh, crossing France. Uh, at first, I thought it was a nice gimmick. Um, so to cross France with a beret was kind of funny to me. Um, and also, I wanted to be recognizable because uh, I'm one of the uh, co-creators of the trek. And because we had a lot of other people on the trek, I wanted to be sure that those people could recognize me on the trek. And I was not the only one wearing it. Um, I co-created it with uh, three other people. And two of them were hiking it, also with a beret. So we all had a beret saying, hey, we are basically staff. If you see somebody with a beret, that's us. Just You, you can talk to us. Um, and at first, it started like a kind of a joke almost. And I have to say, this is the thing I was the most thinking about on my trek. I was so happy about this beret every day because it is really the best protection you can have on the, in the wild. I've been using hats forever and hoods and everything, but the berry beats everything. It doesn't get hot. In the sun, you're absolutely protected because it covers more of your face. Um, it doesn't get blown away. When it rains, it's 100% waterproof. It's made out of merino wool, so it doesn't stink at all. It stays in shape and it's handmade by the last berry manufacturer in France. So it's kind of a big deal because it's it's uh, it's made in France it's this French symbol and everything was working like perfectly fine and I don't even go out without the beret anymore I, and, and that's just I'm in love with this thing it's it's just I don't understand why people don't wear beret in the wild I just don't get it um, that's that's crazy to me now Thomas I'm fired up I'm gonna go buy a beret right now as soon as we're done <laughs> You should, you should. And um, actually, this uh, this woman who does this beret, she does it um, so by hand. There are only two. And we approached them because we wanted to um, actually make Hexatrek beret, so the beret based on our trek. Uh, and she said, no, because that means that I would need to hire more people to work, and I don't want to grow. So I, I love your project. It's really cool. But I don't feel like working more. So no, I'm not doing that. But I'm going to give you three berets, guys. And so we had three berets for free. <laughs> and now I'm talking about this place. It's called Manufacture de Beret. And if you really need to buy a beret one day, this is the only place I would buy a beret. Uh, it's it's genuine. It's indestructible. It has been proven on the field now. Um, this thing is a beast. And and when you take a nap, it's very practical as well. Um, so <laughs> that's really cool. Do they do shipping or do I have to actually go to the store to get it? No, no, no. They they have a, a website uh, and you can order online, luckily. Uh, and I know even that they have some kind of partnership with Australia and there is an Australian uh, reseller, uh, a guy that is like uh, crazy about berets and, and like starting the beret culture in Australia, which I find very funny. Uh, <laughs> but it's used, I mean, the beret is used by shepherds in France uh, a lot. If you go to the Pyrenees, you will see most of the shepherds have a beret on the head and they stay in the mountains for months so there is a reason maybe yeah and i love this this concept i, I have this mental image of the three of you the three of you who have cr created hexatrek out there wearing these berets as uh, identifiers of you know we th this is who we are we're, we're the guys that created the trail do you guys have walmart in france have you heard of walmart no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I even visited a Walmart when I was in the U.S. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, so you know, in Walmart, they all wear the the vests to indicate yes. that uh, they work there. So it's it's kind of like your version of Walmart vest. You've got the yeah the on out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Nice, <laughs> nice. Hey, uh, to help us talk about gear, I know you I, you sound like you could talk about gear forever. Um, mm -hmm. To help us talk about it, we've got something we call it's the hiking pole. The hiking pole. 
Now, this is a, uh, a seven question survey that's going to help me give you a score from one to a hundred on the sanity scale. Okay. With one being completely insane and 100 being completely sane. Okay. Now, anybody okay. who's been out on the trail for, for four, five, six months, they already have a 25 point deduction automatically. So the, <laughs> the top score that you can have is 75. All right. Okay. Now it's poll, hiking poll. It's P O L L, like a survey. It's not like the 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 polls. Yeah. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 So if I were to ask your friends or family, hey, uh, how would you score Thomas on the sanity scale? Give him a score from one to 100. Where, where do you think they'd put you? Oh, if you ask my mom, it's, uh, it's going to be hard. Uh, I haven't had a real job in, in three years, so she would probably say 100 um, because that's what she is the most uh, like. No, that's vice versa. Okay. So zero. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. crazy. Um, yeah, maybe 20 because she knows I can I can cook. So that's that's reassuring to her. Um, if you ask my friend, I think I think I score very high. Um, I'm not a ludicrous kind of person. Um, I take a few gambles. Uh, if you take my friends from the south of France, they would say I'm kind of crazy because I can go in eastern countries and to them it's kind of impossible. But if you ask my friend in Brussels, I think they would score me like a very, very sane person. I just ride a motorcycle, which I think would take maybe five out uh, because it's kind of dangerous. Uh, but when you live in Brussels, this is the only dangerous thing you can do. It's ride a motorcycle and hiking is not really crazy. I'm not doing like, uh, I don't know, like jumping in on cliffs with a parachute. How is it called? Um, um, uh, parachutism, parachutist. Yes. I don't know. I'm not doing that. Uh, so I'm just hiking uh, and, and living in the capital city of Europe. So I think they would rank me quite high. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a score. It's, it's based completely on my opinion of your answers, whether or okay. not I agree with you or not. And, and okay. totally subjective, right? So, um, also in addition to giving me your answer, you want to give me a little explanation because there may be a, an answer I don't agree with necessarily, but you could maybe explain and kind of push okay. your, your point of view. And you said that your mom would give you a 20 because you you know how to cook. What, what's your go-to meal? What, what, what's your favorite thing to cook? Oh, I got plenty. Uh, meat uh, would be my favorite, like a, a normal, like this is my all-time favorite is uh, a coup de boeuf, so a, a beef rib. Um, this is very popular uh, in France, and I've been eating a lot of those uh, after my trail because I was dreaming of them. I was hiking next to the actual cows all the time that were fed in the mountains and they looked so happy and I was like, I want to eat your rib. Um, so that would be one of those. Um, and otherwise, I love Korean food. Um, I make a very amazing bibimbap. Um, I'm really good at bibimbap. And um, you have to know also that in Belgium, French fries are not called French fries because... It's called fries? Yeah. Uh, they would murder you if you say French because there is a war between France and, and uh, no, not between France actually. Just the Belgian are fed up as French people uh, doing fries because uh, Belgium has a religion around fries. The fries here are nothing like you can imagine. It takes it took me five years to master the Belgian fries, and now I make I think maybe the best fries in the country. Um, and I and I and I can go uh, on a fight with that. I have a secret recipe that I uh, worked on for a long time, and my fries are insane. Um, but no, on, on everyday basis, I'm 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 cooking very basic stuff like a, a piece of meat and some vegetables, um, stuff like that. I'm, I'm really like basic on that one. But yeah, and eggs, a ton of eggs, love eggs. Two follow up uh, observations there. When I asked you what's your favorite uh, thing to cook. And you just said meat. I think if you just left it that, that would have been hilarious. Yeah, meat. <laughs> Those cows didn't know what kind of danger they were in. No. Uh, walking by. <laughs> and then I'm also I'm also very tickled that uh, we've got a Frenchman in Belgium, Belgium uh, cooking Korean food. That's that's like the multicultural <laughs> right there. So okay, yeah. So seven questions. You have no idea what I'm going to ask you. Are you ready? Yeah, go for it. A little nervous? Ah, I mean, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question. Easy question. Trekking poles or no trekking poles? Trekking poles. And this, yeah, is, where, sure. this, is, where, this is where you give the explanation. 
of your answer. Okay. Yeah. Um, trekking poles. I, I started hiking without, obviously, like everybody, and I thought I was cleverer than everybody else by not taking them. And I took them just because my tent needed it. Um, I have those uh, this duplex tent from z packs and I had to have trekking poles. The first day of my first through hike, I didn't use them. Second day, I was just like, ah, let's see. And I never stopped. And it's impossible for me now to hike without. And the moment I have my trekking poles in my hand is the moment I'm hiking. I know I'm hiking at this moment. Before that, it doesn't count. But the moment I have them, it's hiking. Yeah, I asked this question intentionally over and over again in the hiking pole because I think there are a lot of novice hikers, hikers out there who, for whatever reason, they're not keen on trekking poles. They, they think yeah. they're going to look funny. Uh, yeah. People are going to judge them. And it's like, you guys don't know what you're missing. You got it. You no. have yeah, I absolutely agree. And I had actually this fight with uh, with a friend in Toulouse. Uh, she's hiking all the time. And, and I was like, you have to try the trekking poles. No, I don't need it. I'm, I'm more nimble like that. And she's hiking all the time, like day hikes. And I, I think I, 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 I now I, I became kind of posh about it. When I see people without trekking poles, I'm kind of judgmental. Like, uh, probably not experienced hiker which is bullshit but it's kind of you know that's uh, after a while i'm like but it has only upsides it doesn't have downsides i don't why not this is yeah this is a, a lost battle for some but that's i mean uh, trekking poles every day i also think it's fantastic that the only reason you tried trekking poles is because you had a, a trekking pole tent yes. <laughs> I would be still not using them and feeling stupid now. But, <laughs> and my knees would be destroyed. <laughs> All right. Question number two. What's on your feet? Boots or trail runners? Trail runners. Mm. Trail runners when I'm doing a long uh, distance hike. Um, I, I crossed France with three pairs of trail runners. Uh, and same, I didn't want to go for trail runners. I was dead against it. I was a boot guy, always been a boot guy. Uh, even on my daily life, I have boots. I don't have sneakers, never wore a sneaker in my life. Uh, I'm not a runner. Um, so I didn't want to go to go through that, but um, I started my uh, creation hike with big boots from Loa uh, that were made for military jungle boots because I thought I was clever. Uh, it absolutely murdered my feet it's it, it wasn't the, the good feet at all it was i was my socks were uh, full of blood i could just like rinse them of blood i was insane so i switched midway to the first pair i could find in the small shop in croatia and they were adidas first time i my life i buy adidas shoes um and it was a revelation again like trekking poles are like ah, okay now i get it yes it's nice um it's very nice for long distance N now on day hikes i think i would still go for uh, boots i got a big pair of mandel boots uh german um boots that i absolutely adore um and if i would do just a day hike i think i would go for those especially in winter conditions or um if it's wet uh, i did some hiking in georgia uh when it was very rainy and the mountains in georgia are not really well maintained so that was quite useful at this point um to cross rivers and stuff but uh yeah no otherwise long distance uh trail runners i'm sensing a trend here your first two answers you, you've started out with you know i thought i was clever yes maybe maybe this isn't the the uh, uh one to a hundred on the sanity scale maybe this is one to a hundred on the clever scale <laughs> maybe yeah <laughs> but, but i will not score very high there <laughs> all right question number three uh when it comes to shelter are you a tent guy tarp hammock bivy or hey let's let's go cowboy camping no, oh my god, no, never go boy camp. Uh, I'm terrified of insects. Um, it's not that I'm terrified of insects, but I have this irrational fear that I will eat them in my sleep, and I don't want to ever wake up with uh, a little fly just like between two teeth. I don't know why, I just have, have this idea that it will happen. Um, no, I'm a tent guy. Uh, I got this duplex that I absolutely adore, even though we could say that it's almost a tarp because it's just one, um, one wall. But uh, I absolutely love my tent. My tent is 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 my house. It's been my house for a long time. Now it's getting old and it, it shows a lot of holes and, and uh, a little bit sad. But um, yeah, no tent forever. Uh, even on nice days, everybody was cowboy camping around me. You're like, nah, I'm putting my tent up. This is this is where I sleep. 
this is important. <laughs> nice. Now I, t- I talked to a, a guy who did the PCT and he was dead set on cowboy camping. He was in a cowboy camp, the whole thing. And wow. he did just fine for the first uh, few weeks until he woke up with a scorpion on his face. No. Yeah. See, it, see, yeah. Mm-hmm. no, that's a no, that's no to scorpions. I'm sorry. I just, I'm old fashioned. No to scorpions. <laughs> All right. Question number four. Inside that tent, uh, in terms of your sleep system, do you use a sleeping bag or a quilt? Again, uh, a quilt. Uh, this time it wasn't uh, because I switched in the middle. I actually looked a lot. The first time I did a through hike um, in Croatia, I never through hiked before. So I had no knowledge, nothing. So I just reviewed a ton of YouTube videos, a ton of blogs. And I was already uh, kind of dead set on having a quilt. So I went for a quilt uh, and didn't regret it a single day. I still have the same quilt. It's a beast. Uh, I love it. So, yeah, no, um, quilt all the way. Okay. And then how about uh, when it comes to food? Are you, uh, do you carry a stove? Do you cold soak or are you stoveless? I definitely carry a stove um, for my coffee. This is very, very important. I also co- carry a um a coffee maker uh, because I refuse to drink instant. Um, I'd rather not drink than having instant coffee. So I make my own coffee every day. Um, I'm that precious. And um, no, I'm, I I need to have warm food at night. It's um, it's important. Although I, I have been making a ton of fires, like uh, campfires and cooking on the campfire quite um, quite a lot. But again, I love cooking. I love eating. Uh, cold cooking is not for me. I don't understand the concept of being sad with your food um the food is a source of happiness and yeah i will not uh skip on that umalo that that sounds like a a very french answer that uh, <laughs> stove for your coffee not instant yeah. coffee but coffee coffee i can i have this great image of you now sitting out in the middle of nowhere uh sipping on your coffee and and sharpening your your pocket knife on the on the uh the bottom of the cup so Th- that that's my everyday all right question number six life is better above or below the tree line below below Uh, this is a reflection i had actually uh for the first time on this hike um on the hexa track because we're going uh very high we're going all all the way to three thousand meters up uh and uh and then we're staying in the mountains quite a lot and I realized that when it's all rocks, I'm losing interest. I don't find any interest. And everything is dead. Everything is telling you, you should not be there. This is not a place for you because there is nothing. You cannot make a fire. How can you be happy in a place where you can't make a fire? I don't get that. I don't get those mountain goats that love to be... I mean, this is a constant battle we have, we have with Kevin, uh, the other... Uh, founding uh, member of the Hexatrek, he is a mountain guy. He loves to be very high in the mountains, taking a ton of risk. And ton of... And I, I'm the opposite. I'm, I love the mountains to look at. I don't need to go up there. Just like, it's beautiful. If I can have my campfire, I'm reasonably, like, reasonably high. Yeah, okay. exactly. Like I, I like that. It's beautiful, but I, I need some grass and some trees, and I'm happy with that. You know, it's just like, let's make a nice fire, have some sausage or some cheese, and just look at the mountain. We don't need to be up there. There is wind, rocks. It's, it's annoying. Have some cheese and some coffee and sharpen our pocket. Uh, pocket. Yes, always. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you don't have strong opinions on things. That you kind of... Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right. Hey, last question in the poll. What's more important, pack weight? Or luxury items? Ah, tough one. Um, on my first attempt, my, my first hike in Croatia, uh, I went for it being as light as possible. Um, I, I spent a ton of money to be as light as possible. And on my second uh, through hike, I was actually heavier. So I think that when it comes to hiking, I, I realized that the luxury of every day was more important than my pack weight in the end. So I would lean towards uh, more luxury, but I'm not, I'm I'm not crazy luxurious either. And I love um, I love to have very ultralight equipment anyway, so I can 
bring some more coffee. Um, this is this is some kind of trade. Is that every time I can uh, shave a hundred grams somewhere, I can pack something better, maybe. So I, I think I finished the trail with way more weight than I was expecting. Uh, plus I'm collecting along the way, and yeah, the comfort is is very important for me when I am out in the trail. Now you're collecting along the way. What what is what is a Frenchman who lives in Belgium and cooks Korean food? What what is he picking up along the way? Oh, I, I picked up um, a few things, uh, things that I was missing, a ton of food. Uh, I have this problem that I always think that I will miss food. So uh, I was carrying a ton of saucisson. So saucisson is is a type of French um, delicacy. It's uh, charcuterie. So it's a sausage that is dry, made out of pork. And it is extremely popular um, amongst hikers because it's basic, basically our beef jerky. It's It's... It, you can keep it in the in the bag. It doesn't go bad. It's full of protein and fat and salt, so everything you want. Um, and saucisson. I always had saucisson and cheese in my in my pack. This was very important. And at some point, I I, I think I had like four or five saucisson at at a given moment because there was a, a huge sale. And I was like, I need to have more saucisson. Oh, and beer. I I often carry a beer uh, that I take uh, in the city below, and then I go up the mountain with the beer, drink my beer, bring back the can, take another one for the up. The... So I was constantly having stuff uh, more in my backpack, and I collected I don't know a few things like um, to repair to uh, um, I think a rock at some point. That was just like weird. I, I carried a ton of stuff. I imagine that the charcuterie board probably adds to your your pack weight as well. Uh, I do have a charcuterie board, uh, obviously, uh, a cutting board um, that was handmade to me and has my name on it um, by somebody in Croatia to uh, to thank me after the trail. And I love this thing. I mean, how can you cut your saucisson without your cutting board? I don't get it. And it's a beautiful. I would never hike without. I need it, uh, and the cheese as well. And you can prepare your sandwiches on it. So that's just very, very efficient. You know, I have a new question now for the hiking pole. Like, I'm going to add on there. You know, do you carry okay. a reward or not? You know, for future guests. That's important. I think. Yeah. I think it tells. It tells a lot. It does. It's very revealing. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. <laughs> All right, Thomas. I, I've got to put your answers through the John Freaking Mirror algorithm. Uh, to come up with this score here. I got to do some math, so bear with me a little bit. I got to carry the two. We're going to divide by root three, uh -huh. multiply by pi, and then we are going to adjust for the water temperature at dawn on the Adriatic Sea. And I come, up with, a, uh, I come up with a solid score of 42. 42. Although that, <clears throat> that can trend downward uh, as the interview progresses. <laughs> <laughs> it can't go upward. It could go upward. I don't think it's going to, though. I, I just okay. I want to be upfront with you. <laughs> 42. Okay. That's uh, what's average usually? Well, if 50 is kind of in the middle. So, okay. So, most people go around 50. That's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. You're, you're closer <laughs> to insane than, than you are sane. So, yeah. Well, you know, I think, I think uh, your mom's got something there. Yeah, probably. She would be uh, happy to hear that. Luckily, she will never because she doesn't understand a word of English. So, <laughs> <laughs> I have this translated in uh, into ninety different languages. So that's nice. <laughs> All right, hey, before we get too far down the trail, Thomas, let's back up a little bit. Uh, tell us about your background. Where'd you grow up? What kinds of sports and hobbies did you play as a kid? And how did you get involved in the through hiking cult? Because um, let's face it, any any group that convinces you to live in the dirt for months on end, that's got to be a cult. <laughs> there is something to it, yeah, definitely. And I'm not helping the case, uh, the, the cause by uh, by creating the hexatrack. Um, so no, I'm um, I'm a typical uh, French average person. Um, I grew up a little bit everywhere in France um, because my family was moving around quite a bit. Uh, settled in Toulouse when I was a teenager and grew up basically in the south of France. Um, nothing extraordinary. Uh, my parents are teachers, so you know we had like a very basic um, cozy lifestyle. I was not a sportive guy at all. Um, I was hating sport. We all hated sport in the family, thinking that people who do sports are stupid by default. So uh, I was a video game player. I was playing a lot of video games. Um, and uh, yeah, that was pretty much my life. Um, after that, I went to, um, I went in Belgium to uh, pass my master's degree in journalism. 
and discovering the beauty of Belgian beers, and um, it's never been the same ever since. Um, and uh, basically, I never really did any sport. Um, I grew up in the south of France, so the Pyrenees were there. My uh, grandparents um, are from the Spanish side of the Pyrenees, and so we were we were going in the little town of the Pyrenees called Saint Marie Soulan, uh, which is actually on the Exa track. It's a, it's a little town with not many people, but a ski resort and. I've been passing a lot of time in this place. Uh, and so hiking with my parents in the Pyrenees, and I hated it because it was not a video game console. Um, and, and then when I was 20 and, and fixed in Brussels, um, I kind of longed for the mountains again um, because there is absolutely no elevation in Belgium. The highest point in Belgium is 700 meters, um, and it's a hill. Uh, and, they, and they built a ski resort on it. So... Um, yeah, uh, barque friture. But um, I kind of invented myself the idea that I was a hiker uh, when I was 20 and, and continued my, my life thinking I was a hiker without really hiking ever. Buying a ton of hiking equipment just because I am a hiker, so I need to buy it, uh, even though I used it maybe for one hike a year when I was going back to the south. So there is really no reason uh, why through hike today. Uh, what happened is that um, I stumbled an upon an article about the Appalachian Trail uh, when I was something like 25 and thought, oh my God, it's completely stupid. People are hiking. That what? It's not possible. It's not human. And then reading a little bit more like, oh, that sounds stupid doable. And, and reading and reading, um, I read the book um, A Walk in the Woods, uh, classic, and really got me into like, oh, I hate bears. But I would love to do that. Um, and then in 2019, uh, my ex-girlfriend broke up with me uh, after 10 years of relationship. So it kind of destroyed me. Uh, I was in a job that I hated. So everything was just down. And I was like, ah, fuck it. Let's go alone in the woods for six months. So I, I started to do everything to uh, to go on the Appalachian Trail. Um, I got even my visa, my uh, B2 visa, to be six months in the U.S., um, and COVID hit. So when COVID hit, uh, obviously, it stopped me from uh, going to the U.S. and hiking. So I had to find another solution, and I discovered this hike in Croatia. And I went into Croatia with all my gear for the U.S. I even went with my bear bag. Uh, but there were tons of bears in in in, um, in Croatia, so I was happy. Uh, even though locals don't understand the concept of bear bag, it's it's a thing that is just like, why do you have a bear bag? Like, if a bear attacks you, you put yourself in the bag. Why? I don't get it. They literally never seen a bear. So, um, so yeah, I I ended up going there. Uh, I through hiked it, and I thought I would never be able to do it, and I did it, and I was kind of happy. Um, I hacked some more the year after uh, in the French Pyrenees. Um, I did 150 kilometers in the Pyrenees. And after that, um, I stumbled upon the Hexatrack project and um, that Kevin uh, has been working on alone um, for the first six months, uh, creating the concept. And I contacted him and said, hey, man, that's exactly what I wanted to do. Like, I crossed... Croatia by foot, and I can't cross France by foot. That's insane. We have tons of things to do. Um, so I wanted to create it, and he had the idea at the same time, but he did something I didn't. So I just contacted him and said, yeah, I want to do it with you. And so we started uh, an NGO, uh, and we've been creating the Hexatrack. And then because we created it, I had to prove that it was doable. So I did it. I hiked it. <laughs> as easy as that. Nice. And we're going to put a pin in that because we're going to come back and talk about your yep. Croatian hike and also the Hexatrack and what that's all about. We're going to take a quick break. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. And welcome back. We are talking to Thomas Wisegi. Wisegi, yeah. That's good. Wisegi? Wisegi? Yeah. Wisegi. All right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to put you <laughs> any further. Uh, also, uh, trail name Pumalo. 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 Okay. Pumalo. Yeah. Got it. Got it. And, you know, I have to tell you, Pumalo, that uh, often I look for the episode title, the podcast episode title, as we go through the interview. And at the end of the last section, I think you, you, you stumbled across it. You said that you're just a typical French guy. And you know what? I'm thinking that atypical is all one word. Atypical. Oh, okay. I see. 
I think <laughs> I, I think that sums it up. I, I mean, I'm I'm really enjoying this and your perspective on things. I think it's a youth perspective. So I think I think you're atypical, no matter where you're from. So that may be the episode outline on uh, the episode title, unless we come across something even better here in the second segment. Yeah, we'll see. Um, I, I mean, I hope it can only go up from now. Okay. <laughs> Now, this is this is interesting that we're going to talk about the Via Adriatica. That's the the yes. Croatian trail that you did. Yes, um, it's um, it, it it's a long um a long trail in Croatia. Uh, basically, the idea is to cross Croatia uh from border to border, and alongside the um uh, the um how's it called um the, the mountain range that is um uh, it's it's the Alps. Basically, it's the the end of the Alps that still goes into the Balkans, um, and this part is also constantly on the shore of the Adriatic Sea. So you are hiking on mountains, looking down at the sea. So it's just gorgeous. Uh, it, yeah, it it's ridiculously beautiful. You have landscapes every day that just blow your mind, and it's um, it, it's a very very it's a brand new trail. Um, when I hiked it at the time, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I just went there completely um, virgin. Yes. Yeah. Couple couple questions before we get into that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had on the podcast N Nikola Horvat, who mm -hmm. was the creator. He did the PCT and he went back to Croatia and said, yeah. "Why don't we have something like this in, in our country?" And so he is he's the the founder I think of the Croatian Long Trail. This is different yes. than Croatian Long Trail. It it is different and it's kind of similar. I mean, uh, a lot of the sections, especially in the mountains of uh, Velebit, um, Biokovo, I think as well, um, are the same. Um, but the the um the Croatian Long Distance Trail uh, doesn't go only on the shore but also inland at some point. So you're, you're doing like um, some kind of a V uh, and not just a line. I didn't even know it existed before I started the Via Adriatica. I, I don't even remember how I really found out about it. It was completely random. Uh, and I know that there is this kind of little feud about which one is a real one and blah, blah, blah. But in the end, yeah, that's like, you know, the, the, when you have two trails, that are trying to be the trail. It's always a little bit of a we don't know, etc. So I'm I'm kind of out of all this like creation drama by now. Uh, but I was a little bit into it because I met a lot of people. Yeah, this uh, is good have... to know. This is good to know because uh, Nicola is going to come back on the podcast. I, I okay, got this episode outline all done, and we're just trying to coordinate a time. And and now I can throw in this piece of information that uh, hey yeah. Tell me about Via the Via Adriatica. I mean, what uh, have you hiked that before? And see, just you know, if that really gets his his dander. But I, I think it it did hike it as well. If I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I'm maybe I'm mixing people, but I think he hiked it as well. Um, but the Via Adriatica basically the idea was to create this long distance trail that, to cross a country by foot, which is something I, I I really like. When I started it, I had no idea. Um, it wasn't a thing, because. It, it, I mean, they have a fantastic website that lured me into thinking that it was an official trail of Croatia. And it absolutely wasn't. Um, it was under development, uh, only volunteer based, based. So no money. So they can't create anything. Really. It was, it's a good looking website. I pulled it up. I pulled it up before yeah. we started today. It looks it looks really good. So I can it's see gorgeous. you might have been fooled to thinking that uh, hey, this <laughs> yes. is a well established, a well established uh, path. Yeah, exactly. So the the moment I hiked it, it was only only been three years that the um the trail existed, and I was the tenth person to hike it. So that was also something completely different um this time. But I didn't know that back then. I discovered that in the end. Um, the year I hiked it, we were three, uh, this summer to hike it. Um, one American girl with Croatian roots. Um, one Croatian girl and myself. Uh, they were all doing their own stuff, and uh, I was hiking by myself. I didn't know there was a community behind it before two weeks, something like that. Um, I thought I would be hiking alone, completely alone, and just figure things out. And I ended up being in one of the largest uh, online community there. It was amazing. Uh, I had so much support. People were crazy about the three of us. We were like the rock stars of the summer in Croatia. Uh, people would recognize me in the street, ask for selfies. 
um, invite me to drink uh, at their house, invite me for uh, showers, uh, invite me on the on the island after. It's like, yeah, come to the island after. We can have a party. So that was that was absolutely insane. I I I became um, I became a sensation when I thought I would be just alone in the woods thinking about my breakup. Um, so, so that was kind of interesting. Um, I had the chance to meet also uh, one of the two other hikers, Carmen, um, and to walk a little bit with her. She is uh, a mom of two, and she had a completely different mindset, and we got along really fine. We worked for a week together, and that was very funny because she also had uh, a fame. She had like articles in the paper and everything. So th that was like weird because you're just here on holidays. Uh, you're just like, I'm, I'm walking on my free time. People are asking me, but who is paying you? I'm, I'm paying. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's so bizarre. When you go to the beach, nobody is cheering you like, yes, you're doing beach very well. It's, it's not possible. So I was very surprised that people could be excited about it. And I loved it. I loved it. It was very fun. And um... French, a French sensation on the, uh, <laughs> the Croatian, the Croatian uh, trail with, with groupies. I mean, this uh, is... yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> that might no, be a, a French sensation. Yeah. Ah, it's a new one. Uh, see, uh, we can pick. We can pick. There will be another one, maybe. We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, it was it was um, very nice. Uh, the trail wasn't that difficult for most of the sections because it's, um, for example, if you go in the Velebit, the Velebit is the main mountains in in uh, um, in Croatia, and you have the Premuzic Trail, which is a trail that is impressive for seventy kilometers. Um, they built in the nineteen tens uh, a high route over uh, rocks that should not be there. Uh, by hand with like um, like pickaxes, and this thing is beautiful. Also in Croatia, you have a ton of uh, mountain huts that uh, are open for anybody and are maintained by uh, groups of hikers that take a lot of pride in well maintaining those huts. So you have the best huts in the world in Croatia, and you can sleep for free in most of the places. Um, it, it it was really impressive, and at the same time. The trail in the mountains were good, but whenever they had to make junctions, it just didn't exist. So you had a GPS that were telling you, uh, you see this wall, it's there. And, and I, the first time it happened, it was a week after I was starting hiking, I, I was really like on, on the foot of a mountain looking up into a wall of vegetation with no single element indicating that it could pass. It was a jungle and saying, go through it. And I didn't believe it. I had to contact somebody like, yeah, is it really there? Because I was going up and down, up and down. Like, there is no way. There is no, And it is the way. And the way is you push your face against the vegetation and then you keep doing that for two kilometers. <laughs> and, and you always end up being scratched everywhere, bloody with spiders on your face. And it... And it's just all the time like that because the places that are not maintained by professionals or volunteers are left as it is. And the only people passing are the people doing the Via Adriatica, and that's 10 people. So that was difficult. You had like very had difficult to, sections. That had to be terrifying for you. I mean, especially with your fear of insects. Well, I don't have a fear of insects. I just don't want to eat them. <laughs> I'm fine with them crawling. It's fine. I don't care. I just don't want them to be in my mouth. So this is the place. You, you pushed your face through the vegetation and you made sure your mouth was closed. Exactly. You close okay. everything and, and you just push it on. I and see. at the beginning, it's terrifying. And at the end of the trail, I was just going headfirst everywhere. I didn't care. It was really like it's a second nature. You just like go into the bushes. It's It's normal. Nice. All right. Hey, have you heard of Type Two Fun? Um, I, I I looked into it. So it's this kind of fun. Uh, is it related only to being a difficult situation and after finding it fun, or what is the actual definition? Yeah. So Type One Fun is you're having fun doing it, and but you don't really talk about it much after it's over. Uh, there's a lot of Type One Fun out there. Uh, it's fun when it happens, but it's not very memorable. Now, okay. type two fun is you are definitely not having fun while it's happening, but 
these are the stories you love to tell after the fact. I mean, I these are the stories that you, that you tell at your family gatherings. In fact, your family is, is get so tired of them. They see you coming and they head the other, the other direction. Uh, did you encounter any, any serious situations out there that you're like, Oh my gosh, what is going on here? Um, so you, you weren't really having fun when it happened, but you, you, these are, these are the good stories. Well, yeah, obviously, um, I, I, I was confused by the idea of type two fun. Like it becomes fun after when you think about it, because I, I hold a grudge. Uh, when a situation is not fun, I'm hating the situation until the end. It makes for a good story, but I'm hating it. And I, I, and I could, if I could, I would stop thinking about it, but I can't. Um, yeah, obviously. Uh, for example, during my uh, Via Adriatica, uh, I was on the landmine field um, because there are still landmines in uh, Croatia from the war of um, the 90s, um, from the Balkan War. And uh, they are trying to demine. Uh, so, so Bosnia has a lot of it. Uh, Croatia has uh, still a little bit of it, not so much, but still enough to be annoying. Um, and it's deep in the mountains, so it's really hard to uh, demine in Croatia. And on top of that, because the war was unconventional, usually when you put landmines, you put them on a map, and then after that, when the war is over, you can just grab them back. But the way it happened in Croatia, the way they explained it to me is that uh, one army came, put some mines. The other army came, put their mines over the other ones and vice versa. So you have like this kind of um, cake of mines uh, that are everywhere and that are now 30 years old, 20, 30 years old, yeah, kind of old, but still there. And... At some point, the trail uh, took me uh, and Carmen, that was the week I was hiking with Carmen, took us both to a landmine field. And it was completely out of trail. Uh, we had to go down um, down a cliff, basically, uh, on large rocks. It was very annoying. And once we were down there, this was the landmine. And we didn't realize it would be there. And you had like signs everywhere, like red signs with a, a skull saying landmine, 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 landmine everywhere. But we couldn't go back up because it was such a damn cliff that we had to push. And we pushed through the landmine uh, and you had like those little um, uh, wood stick uh, that were stabbed in the ground with a little ribbon, a red or a white. But we didn't know what it meant. Um, so apparently there should have been a corridor that was safe, but it wasn't possible to say. On top of that, everything was overgrown because nobody has been demining that since 20 years. So some trees fell on it. Uh, the ribbon like flew off in many places. Um, so you literally have no idea what you're doing. And, and you have to push through this kilometer of landmine field. That is the least fun I had in my entire life because I really thought this is it. Because you cannot predict it. And because I've been watching way too many movies, I said to Carmen, uh, let's separate from 15 meters. So just in case. And after that, I read that they were using bouncing mines that can kill all the way to 100 meters. So that was useless anyway. Um, so we crossed it. Did uh, you make her go first? Uh, yeah, of course. I'm I'm a, I'm I'm a, I'm a gentleman. <laughs> no, I, I can't remember. I think that is terrifying. It, it, it's horrible. It's horrible, and, and I'm pretty sure that it is. It has been mainly demined, and it was a safe zone. I'm pretty sure it was, but on the moment when you have signs everywhere, you are absolutely certain it is my landmine feels that is still active because otherwise they would not put signs. Um, especially because it's in the middle of absolutely nowhere. It's really hard to get to this place. So why would they bother? Um, Umlo, Umlo, I think, and this is why the only ten people have done the uh, done the trail. <laughs> no, but they they have removed this section uh, since now. The trail has evolved a lot. It was three years ago. Um, so now there is absolutely no risk uh, whatsoever. But then at this point, it was really horrible. Um, we pushed through it, and um, we were really on the edge. Both of us were really, really mad. So we had to sit down and just like, and I took out my emergency rakia. Uh, so rakia, uh, I can show any. Uh, rakia is uh, alcohol <laughs> uh, from emergency, Croatia. Emergency alcohol, and and this is something I learned in Croatia. They never go hiking without rakia 
because they don't it, it's like not having your knife it's impossible to even imagine because it serves for everything in case you have a problem you can drink it. in case you're cold you can drink it in case you have a cut you can clean your wound um it's it's like the perfect thing to have Thomas, the, and, the Croatians know that there is a landmine field on on the trail. They they take they take the alcohol to to drink yeah. before they go through, so they're not <laughs> as terrified. You're you're joking, but it's not that far away from the truth. When you take a breakfast in Croatia and they know you're a hiker, there is always a glass of rakia because how can you go in the mountains without drinking rakia first? It's impossible. That makes no sense. So I took out the emergency rakia. We sat down, we drank, and it was like. The nerves were calming and like the hands stopped shaking. That was that was a nice moment when it was over. And then there was a guy with a gun because he was apparently hunting and we saw it like right after. Like, is there a man on the gun looking? Oh, okay, yeah, no, forget it. I don't care. <laughs> we're out of the minefield. <laughs> Thomas, I have to tell you that this is episode 219 of Ooh. the John Freaking Mirror Pod. So we I've talked to a lot of people. Yeah. We've gone through a lot of scenarios. We've gone through a lot of type two fun. This has to be the most terrifying <laughs> piece of type two fun that I have ever heard. You know, <laughs> coming face to face with uh, a, a landmine field with with no way to go back. You you've got to yeah. got to go forward, and not you're not sure. You know exactly. You know is you know, how dangerous is this, and and then doing it, and that's I, I can't even wrap my head around that. Yeah, I mean either. That, you see, um, <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> I have no idea how it happened. Uh, I know it's not the case anymore. It's, so you go on the Via Adriatica, it's safe, no worries. But <laughs> it was a wild time back then, you know, three years ago. Uh, that was just, <laughs> wow. It was the far west. Just <laughs> Back in the day. Back in the day. Back in the day when I was young. <laughs> hey, uh, let's let's spend a little bit of time talking about the Hexatrek. You mentioned that a couple of times in the first segment. Um Yes. Tell us about that. I know, I know you kind of referred to it as you, you, you there should be a trail where you'd be able, you'd be able to walk across France, just like you did with, with Croatia, but it didn't exist. And you, you came, I'm assuming you came across it online. Some guy who was trying to do that and it's, it's yeah. called it's a trek. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so basically the story is this, I crossed Croatia by foot and I was thinking I want to cross my country by foot. It makes more sense. Um, and Kevin, so the guy who started it all, uh, had the same idea. He, he did actually the PCT and after doing the PCT he was like, oh, why don't we have that in France? Um, he started working on it, uh, doing literally everything by himself at the beginning. Uh, so everything was kind of Plunky. Uh, he, he spent a lot of time by himself in a 16 meters square room, just thinking about it and just talking to himself and stuff like that. So when I discovered him, it was kind of a an odd um, sight. Um, but he, he had the idea of um, not asking for permission, which is something that I would not have done. Um, so because it's France and it's very complicated legally on so many points, which is one of the main issues we have uh, at the Hexatrek. Uh, so he just created it. He took a map and said, yeah, let's go like, like this. It, it, completely out of nowhere, just like looking at maps. He never went to the Pyrenees and still like drew a line. And was like, yeah, it should pass. Um, it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> some places it doesn't. Um, but it passed most of the time. And um, I, I discovered that and it was exactly the idea I had. Um, so I contacted him. Uh, I, it, I thought I would do it like, in a five years period because having all the authorization talking to the main people etc and actually no no because he was um starting to do it so um we talking we decided to actually go for a non-profit uh because he didn't really have like an idea he's the kind of person who has a million of ideas but doesn't really implement them so then after that i was like okay okay let's do something that we can actually do um and that was the um the non-profit and we started working um on the non-profit uh with another guy named dylan um who did the tearoa in uh, new zealand yep and and had the same idea um he's a videographer and shortly after that uh we had william who is now uh, also part of the uh the hexatrack team uh that joined us so the four of us we started working on this crazy idea to have the ultimate french trail um Thomas, we wanted to have Thomas, yeah. kevin dylan and w william yeah those don't those aren't like your typical french names are they uh it is 
Uh, actually, it's a joke in France. Uh, Kevin and Dylan are are supposed to be very stupid people. That's the kind of name that we give to stupid people. Uh, and that's the, the joke everybody does. Like when somebody does something, ah, it's a Kevin. Uh, it's a Dylan. Because there was this trend in uh, the 80s, uh, because of all the sitcom from America, that some people would name their child after those names because it looked cool. But it looked cool only to the kind of people that are not. And so th there is this kind of ongoing joke like Kevin, uh, Dylan. Uh. So it's funny to have Kevin and Dylan. And on top of that, Dylan, I'm going to give a shout out to the guy. Uh, his last name is in French, Moron. But in English, Moron. So his name is Dylan Moron. And <laughs> it literally spells the same. So, yes, when we started this, I was like, it, it's good we have a Thomas in the middle because <laughs> it's good there is a French name in the middle. So, so the French, what I'm getting from this is that the French are making fun of Americans with uh, the, the Kevin and the whole Kevin and Dylan thing. No, no, no. It's not about the, the Americans. It's about the people who thought it was cool to name their child after Americans. And often than not, when you see somebody who makes a mistake, it's like your Florida man. Your Florida man here is a Kevin. Like somebody who does something <laughs> stupid, it's definitely a Kevin. So, this, all, this all of our listeners, all of our listeners in Florida, keep listening. Don't don't get upset. We all know no, weird things sorry. happen in Florida. If you see if you see a headline, a bizarre headline in the news about something just absolutely bonkers that happens, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't care what it is. Odds are, it's probably in Florida. It's probably yeah. it probably happened in Florida. So, okay. <laughs> I just, I'm sorry. I, I had to, I to interrupt you and ask you about those names because that no, I understand. Funny, okay. <laughs> so yeah, and and so we have and William actually um is um binational is French and British um so his his name is um, British William, um but it works in French as well. Um, so yeah, we we um we've been working on this uh, basically on uh, on no ground because nobody has ever hiked it. Um, we connected a lot of French trails, and. Try to find the best possible line to connect France. The idea was to try to go from one border to the other. So we're starting in the north of France. We're starting in um, in Les Vosges, so next to Strasbourg, at the border with Germany. Then we're going down all the Vosges, which is mountain range, then into the Alps, another mountain range. Then we're crossing into Les Gorges, uh, the Vercors, um, and other places in more central France to avoid going to the Mediterranean. And then we're going straight down to the Pyrenees and then crossing all of the Pyrenees and ending up at the sea, um, so it, next to the um, the Spanish border. So the idea really is to try to to take like a, a map of France and just having a line going like I'm going from one point to another um, and staying as much as possible in the wild, as wild as it can be in France, um, to to have a real through hike and not just um, a simple walk uh, like you could have, like, for example, uh, with the Camino. Um, it, it's really the idea was to have some kind of walk where you can tent almost every night um, and to really have this feeling of freedom that you get from through hiking. Right. What Do you, do you know what the elevation gain is on that route? Yes, it's uh, it, it's subject to change. So the route is going to change quite a lot over the years. Um, so... This edition, it was 140,000 uh, 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 meters uh, of elevation uh, on the entire route. 140. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's a lot. Uh, it's, it's, it's a thigh burner. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, um, I mean, this is mostly done in the Alps and the Pyrenees because those mountains are freaking huge. Um, but, and we're going up and down uh, too much, a uh, lot. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, one of the great things about um, some of the American trails, like the PCT, th there's switchbacks. So when you when you're covering that elevation, you know you're 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 going up gradually, but mm -hmm. still, still it feels it feels like you, you get up pretty quickly with with not as much effort. I know I know on the AT, the Appalachian Trail, not as many switchbacks, and there's not as much elevation. But because of, of the lack of switchbacks, um, mm -hmm. it's it's no joke. I mean, you're going straight up or straight down. Um, with this new trail, uh, any switchbacks on the trail, or is it is it like up and down? It's very um, it's it's it changes a lot depending on where you are. 
in some sections of the Alps and the Pyrenees, uh, there are very nice switchbacks when it's kind of a famous place um, and it's it's been arranged like that. And some sections, you go straight up the mountain, uh, straight on the rocks. It's uh, It gets very technical quite fast. Um, so it really depends on the area. It depends on um, the kind of um, terrain that you are in. Um, it's it's really hard to imagine doing because I know the PCT, for example, has been um, <clears throat> thought to be done by a horse. So you, you you should be like with a horse all the time. It's absolutely impossible to think that uh, for the French mountains because of the way they are shaped. They are very aggressive style sometimes when you go uh, in elevation, and it it becomes very difficult. And at the same time, on the GL10, you have uh, the GL10 is the uh, the section in the Pyrenees. <clears throat> on the GL10, you have some sections where they go straight up the mountain for no reason. There is a nice forest. They can do switchbacks, but no, they decided to go straight up, straight down, and 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 you're just mad those days. Uh, it's, it's really like, come on, just make me turn a little bit. It's just like, um, so yeah, it, it really depends all the time. Rage hiking and then holding grudges. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's what I do all the time. Yeah. I, I imagine, <laughs> I imagine that that line that Kevin drew through the Pyrenees, that was, that was the part where there's no switchbacks. He just thought, Oh yeah, we can get through that. That shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> it is actually because, um, so you have the um, one main route, uh, that goes across the Pyrenees, which is the GR10, uh, a GR in French stands for Grand Randonnée. So it means it's an official hiking trail that is being maintained. That is an excellent condition. It's a joy to walk on. Um, and it's very famous. You have a ton of people on it. You can always find somebody, etc. And then you have the HRP, the Haute Route Pyrénéenne, High Pyrenean Route. And this is a trek that doesn't exist. Um, you have plenty of books on it, uh, but there is no trail. And it's basically just an indication. Like, you see this pass over there? Just go there. Uh, you find your way. And um, so the, the uh, Hexatrack for the moment has a mix of the GL10 and the HRP. And you have this long section on the HRP that is really difficult, really hard, um, that I didn't do because I don't want to die. And um, so it's it, for the moment, it's, it's kind of a mix um, of the two, but it will change um, on the next edition. We are uh, making a lot of adjustments um, based on a lot of things. Because the trek, for example, for this year was... Really hard, really, 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 really hard. We have people made who made the who did the PCT, uh, saying that it's infinitely has harder. It's it's like really, 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 um, a killer. So we're we're going to adjust to make it more um doable uh for um non uh, mountain goats. Okay, <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, very coincidental that the the last person I interviewed. A uh, 21-year-old who did the Appalachian Trail, Kaylin Brown, she also mentioned that one of her future goals was to do the HRP. This is the first time I've ever heard of the HRP. Now, in back-to-back -back weeks, we were talking about the HRP on the podcast. So that's a uh, small world. Yeah, it is. But it's quite famous, actually. We have a lot of people. Usually, you, you can see a difference between the HRP people and the GL10 people um, on the trail. So during my crossing of the Pyrenees, uh, I stayed on the GL10 the whole way because the HRP doesn't interest me in the slightest. Uh, again, all elevation, absolutely no comfort whatsoever. What's the point? Um, but uh, you, you could spot the people doing the HRP because they were do, they were having the best gear of them all. They were... You know, they were looking like Americans doing the PCT. And all the others that were looking like regular folks with, like, decathlon bags, they were doing the GL10. And every time you meet somebody, they will tell you, no, no, I'm not doing the GL10. I'm doing the HRP. Kind of a little bit, you know, like, smug about it. Like, no, no, no. no. <laughs> GL10. A little GL10. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. That's nothing. <laughs> I'm a real one. I'm doing the HRP. <laughs> now, Pumalo, you were the guinea pig for the Hexatrack? Uh, one of them, yes. One of them. We oh, had that's right. You had three. Of, they had three of you out there with berets doing doing the hexa trek. Yes, and we had plenty of people hiking it as well. So we the trek didn't exist. Um, we published uh the the track and an app. We um we developed an app for uh, for the hexa trek to have the GPS um on it, and um, a lot of people actually did the hexa trek this year. We don't have the final numbers yet of how many people hiked it, but at least 200 something like that wow. uh tr try the hexatrack yeah 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 and uh, um and that was amazing to meet a lot of them on the trail uh and to even hike with some of them at some points so 
We were the guinea pigs. I was actually the first one to start uh, the entire Hexa Trek. Uh, I started in May, 6th of May. Um, another guy started before me, but he did just a section. Um, so I was officially the first one to just like tackle the whole thing. And I was also the slowest one. And I wanted to stay like that. So the joke was for all the people doing it sobo like me uh, to try and catch up with me because they knew they could. Um, so for a month, I didn't see anybody catching up with me. I was like, well, what the hell are they doing? And after that, every two, three days, I had, like somebody passing by. Hey! <laughs> and some people I hiked with for a few weeks after that. It was, it was kind of fun to, to have this, um, this kind of crowd of people discovering the trail at the same time as us, mm -hmm. basically. That's amazing. Now with your experience on the Via Adriatica in Croatia, are you looking to bring that same type of spirit to the Hexatrek? Are we going to have groupies on the trail, people <laughs> cheering you on as you're as you're hiking? Or are the French a little bit different in that respect? Oh, they are definitely different than that. Uh, they're not excited to see people coming. Uh, and they're not so proud of their country that they are so happy to have a foreigner enjoying it. Uh, it's more like, well, where, are you, where are you here? Um, no, I've, I've been actually very surprised by the support of the French people. Um, I was not expecting that. I was kind of a little bit afraid of that, uh, that people would just be mad at you passing by. But... Um, 99% of all my encounters with local people when I was talking, because I spent my entire life talking about the Hexa Trek. When I was talking to the locals about the Hexa Trek, they were all constantly excited by the idea. They loved it. A lot of people helped me without me asking for it. And a lot of trail magic happened without even like knowing what trail magic is for those people. So that, that, was, um, that was very, very, very enjoyable. Um, but the Hexa Trek being... Like for the first year, that is a dry year, just a test year. We already have like almost 200 people. Uh, we know we're going to have a lot of people every year because it's France. So we don't have to sell it. It's it's sold by itself. It's the Alps and the Pyrenees. Um, plus all the things that you will discover in, in between them. Because I think the best is not in the Alps and the Pyrenees at all. It's everything else. But... We know we're going to have a lot of hikers. Uh, so because there will be so many hikers, there won't be rock stars. There will be regular folks. And on top of that, if you go in the Pyrenees knees in the Alps, you have plenty of hikers. So you're just one of the many. It's not very interesting in those places. It's more interesting in Le Vosges. It's more interesting in Le Cos, in, in Larzac, in all those places where they don't see so many hikers. But in the Alps and the Pyrenees, yeah, you're just a hiker. Okay. And how, what is the, the length of the Hexatrek in its current form? 3,034 kilometers. 3,340 kilometers. What does that translate to in miles? Do you know? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, I would say less than. Uh... <laughs> 3,340 times 0. 0.6. So, all right. I'll do the math. I'll put it. I'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> I should know it. I should know it because I've talked to many Americans. But uh, yeah, no, I just I forgot. <laughs> hey, what what is next on your list in terms of adventure? Is it just going to be continuing to refine the Hexa Track? So yeah, that will be. Uh, um, there is a lot of work uh, that needs to be done on Hexa Track. We need to uh, to beef up the uh, the NGO so that it it is sustainable by itself. We need to find money because we have absolutely no money uh, for it for the moment. So it's limiting everything we want to do. Um, we need to um, we need to create a team. We need to create some people on the um, on the field that can actually uh, do the work. We need to. There is a ton of things to do um, on the Hexa Track, and it's exciting because we're developing a trail that we want to. We want it to be one of the main trails in Europe, if not the main trail in Europe. We we want to to have people. We have a lot of Europeans who want to go to the US to do the PCT or the Appalachian Trail. We want them to be able to just say to have the Hexa Trek as one of the options as well, and and to be as famous as it as it is um, for the PCT and the Appalachian Trail. And we have people already who said, yeah, I wanted to do one of those, but. I saw the Hexa Trek and it's more convenient and yeah, I don't know France, so let's let's take a let's take a gamble. So there is this. Um uh, I need to find a job at some point, uh to pay um for <laughs> for my bills. Uh and in terms of adventures, um I'm I'm thinking about a lot of things and at the same time I'm thinking of nothing. Uh, it's kind of too many options. Um I don't know if I will do a through hike again. I'm not sure. 
um, because that one was a lot. Uh, and I think it was a little bit too long for my taste. Um, the the Via Adriatica was 1,100 kilometers, and, and I enjoyed it way more. Uh, at the end of the Hexa Trek, I was really done with it. I was like, I, I want to finish it. I can't, I can't take another mountain. Um, but if I had to through hike again, um, I have two hikes that I, that I really am interested in. Uh, there is the Transcaucasian Trail in uh, um, in Georgia and Armenia. Uh, I was living in Georgia for three months last year, and I met with one of the organizers. Um, so big shout out to the Transcaucasian Trail. That I, uh, I I found this project amazing. Crossing the Caucasus Mountains is is just and Georgia is just an amazing place. I mean, just ah, I could talk for hours about that. Um, so yeah, there will be the Transcaucasian Trail, which is also a trek that is quite fit quite brand new and there is a lot of things to do uh, I don't think I would be excited to do a trail that is so famous like the Appalachian Trail anymore uh, because it's I, I don't have this feeling of discovering I think and the last one will be the trail um, in South Korea uh, I can't remember the name Taodeong, something like that and it's again it's a through hike to cross uh, South Korea uh, by foot through the mountains and that excites me quite a lot because they they love mountains but a very different way than we do and I want to discover that and again I love Korean food so uh, that's a bonus so yeah so it will be a trek in Georgia or in Korea if I had to do another one Nice. And, you know, I did, I did the math while you were talking. It's uh, 2,000 miles, 2,004 miles. So, well, that's that sounds like a lot of miles. That's pretty significant. Yeah. I mean, 30, <laughs> 40, 3,340 3, kilometers, that's significant uh, as well. But just to put it in, in, in my to wrap my mind, around, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 2, 000, that's, uh, that, that's big. That's big. Yeah. Uh, and, and tell us about the name. Why? Why Hexatrek? What, what's the significance of the Hexa? Uh, so Hexa um, is a short for Hexagon, uh, uh, and in France, we call our country the Hexagon. Um, I know it's a thing that nobody knows outside of France, but uh, if you read it, like, for example, in the news, the uh, news anchor will say, and today in the Hexagon, we have blah, 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 uh, because it's shaped like a Hexagon, and we've always been calling it the Hexagon. So Hexa Trek. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I like that. And who knew? Who knew? I had no idea that. It, that I know it's, a, it, and we realize it's a very French thing, and and it's uh, this is what we like as well because it's not so much in your face, and at the same time, it is essentially French without having to be like too much French. So that was kind of a, a nice mix. Uh, yeah, it, it's it was weird at first for the name for me, but it grew on me, and now it's yeah. I don't think of another name for that. Some insider information there about France. If you want to, if you want to show off to the French next time you go visit, make sure you refer to the country as the Hexagon. You'll be yeah. accepted. They will immediately stop sharpening their knives on the <laughs> way, and you'll be a welcome participant. In what <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> All right, hey Thomas, you know where we are? It, it, I'm sorry. You know where we are? Where are we? Where we are in a podcast. We are in a podcast and the pro tip insight of the week. That's right. Half calf. It is time for the pro tip insight of the week. Pumalo is going to share some trail wisdom with us to make our listeners next outdoor experience even better. So what do you have for us, Thomas? Oh, um, being Pumalo, uh, um, I would say don't skimp on the luxury. Uh, don't skimp on, on, on the thing that makes you happy uh in the morning don't don't skimp on the thing that makes you want to uh to continue um i find that on a very long trail especially the the motivation runs off after a while it it gets boring I, I know we shouldn't say that too much but it gets boring after a while it's always the same so having something that makes you happy uh something that you know will make you happy is is essential so for me it is a, the small luxury item my kindle to read a book because sometimes i'm i'm tired i want that uh it is my coffee maker uh my aeropress that i absolutely adore and makes me happy every time i, I take it out um i would say don't go the ultralight to be ultralight to be efficient stop trying to be efficient enjoy just yeah slow down that's fine it's just like it's it's, it's a different philosophy and um just enjoy the little things you, you, nobody is pushing you just yeah you're on the holidays enjoy <laughs> don't skimp and enjoy that's fantastic 
So there you have it. That's it. This episode is just about in the books. Hope our listeners enjoyed our time with Thomas. Want to thank him for joining us this week. Humalo, how can our listeners keep up with you on social media and where can they find updates on your latest adventures and more information on the Hexatrack? So uh, you can go on hexatrack.com. That's the uh, the easiest one. Uh, we are also um, active on Instagram. You can check Hexatrack. Um, it's it's quite easy to find. Uh, as for me, um, so as I said, my uh, handle name is Cartapouille. So if you want to know more, you can follow me on Instagram. This is where I am the most um, active. Uh, and also on my YouTube channel, because during my uh, Hexatrack through hike, I was recording a documentary. And now is the very annoying process of editing it. So it will take me weeks. But once it's uh, ready, I will do episodes that I will publish on my uh, channel. Again, Cartapouille on YouTube, and you and you can find me. And finally, if you want to leave the uh, trail in a different way, you can listen to the podcast I was recording on the trail. It's called In a Tent with a Frenchman. Um, it's uh, it's available everywhere on Spotify. On I don't know everywhere there is podcast. I think it's there. Um, and In a Tent with a Frenchman is a, a episodes of five minutes, five to ten minutes that I was recording every night in my tent, uh, talking about life on the trail, thoughts, everything. It, it, it's kind of a mixed bag of a lot of things. Um, it gets to any kind of feelings. If I feel good, it's it's a good podcast. If I feel bad, it's a bad podcast. I mean, it's it, it's raw. I never recorded an episode two times. It's, it's raw information every time. No matter what happened, I was recording my podcast. Even if it was midnight and I was drunk, I was recording my podcast and uh, I got drunk a lot. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, that's a different way of uh, living the trail, I think. Um, and on the Instagram, you can see all tons of pictures and stuff that people like <laughs> is the podcast in english or french or both in english in english, english. okay all right i am subscribing i'm, I'm gonna listen to that that's awesome <laughs> cool right. at least one yeah remember <laughs> to check out the pod on social media as well we are on facebook youtube instagram twitter and tiktok and if you've got something you want to uh you want to share with me you can send it to me at john at gmail.com the Adventure Media Recommendation. Thomas, I'm also looking to you to share a recommendation for a book, a movie, documentary, some kind of, of outdoor media uh, that's going to help keep our listeners connected to the to the outdoors. We're calling this our Adventure Media Recommendation. What do you have for us? Uh, uh, this is where um, this is where I'm terrible. Uh, I'm not consuming anything outdoor related. Uh, because in my real life, I, I consume more video games related content. Um, it's it, like the outdoor is, is such uh, out, outside of my um, daily scope. So the only thing I could say is um, is a walk in the woods because that's probably the only one. The only one I read, and I don't want to read another one. It's fine. I'm done. I'm just. This is the one. Um, so yeah, a big classic, the most classic ever. But Walk in the Woods by I can't remember even the name of the author, but it's Bryson. This is perfect. Bryson, yeah, yes. Bill Bryson, yeah. Yep. I had a feeling you were going to go there when you started that whole thing about I don't know and and. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I go for uh, the most classic of them all. It, it it makes sense. It's like book recommendation. You can say Tolkien. You know, you, you're never wrong. It's it right. works. Solid. <laughs> Solid. Okay. What have we not asked you? All right, and before we wrap things up, just one more segment for you called "What Have I Not Asked You That You're Dying to Tell Us About." What did we miss today? Um, I'm, it's um, I would talk about um. The difference you can have between a French trail and an American trail, because um, obviously I imagine uh, the audience here being more American based and um, on through hiking. Um, I would I would like to to explain a little bit more what this Hexatrack is about, um, because we sometimes we wanted to say so much that it's the French PCT that I think we misled people. Um, we will never have in France as much wilderness as there is in the US. The US is gigantic and you have a lot of places with literally nothing. The Hexatrack will never be like that. It's not possible. We are in a small country that is well developed and the trails in the mountains have been existing for hundreds of years. Uh, it's been used forever. So you will go on the Hexatrack in tons of mountains, in tons of wilderness. You can put your tents every night, almost everywhere. So there won't be any problem on that. But you will pass so many villages. 
you will pass so many uh, farms, you will pass so many um, restaurants, so many auberges, so many. You will always have a blend of wilderness and culture. And I think this is something very unique to the trail that I discovered while doing it. Um, I love this mix because it allows me to have a meal in a small French restaurant with local food that is produced exactly where I'm going to sleep this night, which is up the mountain. So you will discover, for example, in the first part um, areas, uh, there is a Nazi concentration camp because that's part of the history of the region. You will find a battlefield for the World War I and a battlefield for World War II. Uh, you will find churches everywhere, castles everywhere that have been built a, a thousand years. It's it, The history is everywhere. Culturally speaking, I... I invite you to try every possible cheese you will encounter because you will walk in in the mountain and on one side of the mountain there is one cheese and on the other side there is a different cheese and it, they all have a different history and different taste and a different way of being eaten. So uh, uh, what I love about the Hexa Trek is not that it is a wild trail, uh, but it's a European trail. We will never have this kind of wilderness, but we have this blend uh, that works, to me, exceptionally well. So don't try to push miles. I don't think pushing miles is made for this because you will skimp on a lot of things that are amazing. Don't eat only dry food. You will find a ton of good food on the trail. I mean, this is, I can tell. <laughs> you you will find a ton of things that will blow your mind. So don't uh, don't go to to the Hexa Trek like you would go on on the PCT. Um, be more mindful of what the trek is going to give you. Doesn't mean that you can't. You do absolutely what you want. If you want to run it, you can. Somebody actually ran it already, so you can definitely run it. Um, and and you can push miles if you want. But I think that there is more to discover if you take your time and enjoy it. Um, as to discover the country and the culture, and not just uh another pile of rock. It's it's more than than mountains. There is so much more. That is fantastic. I'm sold. I'm sold. Where do I sign? <laughs> is there a permit process? Uh, how does this work? No, but for the moment we have nothing because uh, we don't have um, any legality. We are passing on trails that already exist. So anybody can just pick up the GPX and just go. And if you don't like the way the trek is taking you, we're in France. We have a ton of trails that are side to this one. So if you don't want to go somewhere, just don't. Take another one. It doesn't matter. Just walk. It's fine. It's it, we are very we're not very strict. <laughs> we're French. I, I, thought, I, thought for, I thought for sure there'd be three guys out there in berets checking permits. Yeah, the... no. Sadly, no. We will uh, we will have an <laughs> army of Barrett man later, but not now. <laughs> All right. Hey, fantastic. That was that's a wrap from the John Freaking Muir Studio. Any shout outs to friends and family, Thomas? Well, um, a, a big shout out to the uh, the Hexatric family. Um, so Kevin, William, and Dylan. Um, uh, yeah, a big shout out to them because w without this team, we would not have done anything. Um, and well, friends, uh, if you speak English uh, <laughs> and that you've been hearing, uh, well, thank you for listening to me. And family, obviously not because they don't speak English. So uh, my mom would not care in the world. <laughs> So yeah, no, I have nothing else. Um, yeah, the exact track team, and oh, yeah, yeah, no, actually, uh, the people who were crazy enough to believe in us and go on the track this year. Um, if you've been listening to this podcast, uh, I can't believe that you took a leap of faith to uh, to do a trail that doesn't exist, and it makes us pass not for insanes, but for people who actually have a project that can work. So that that's that's amazing. All right, two things. Big shout out to Pumalo's mom. Let her know that Doc said <laughs> hi. Um, and then also your score has been adjusted downward into the 30s because of the whole minefield story. So there you oh, go. Oh, Rick, yes. Yeah, it, I knew this would just plummet the score. <laughs> All right. Hey, thank you for tuning in. Always remember the trail is the trail. It doesn't care if you want to go downhill. It doesn't care if it's almost dark and you're looking for a campsite. It doesn't even care if you've just hiked through a minefield and you've consumed all of your emergency alcohol. The trail is the trail. Embrace the suck.